So I took all the students up in first through eighth grade to the sanctuary, and I watched the movie with them while the teachers were meeting, and we watched uh, Lion King. And on there, uh, the little baboon Rafiki says something to Simba, and he keeps asking him because he was discouraged, and he ran away from home, and he said, I'm never going back. I can't be what I'm supposed to be. And he kept saying, who are you? And, you know, it kept ringing through my mind. I ignored it. And last night I was over here working, setting up some more stuff. And the Lord just kept directing me, that's your message today. <laughs> so scrap the old one. <laughs> We're going to do a new message today. And the thought of our message is, who are you? Now, if you look at this picture on the screen, you'll kind of get a picture of what's happening. This is kind of what happened. Believe me, Disney was not pointing to Jesus. I know that. But yet, you can learn lessons and... In so many situations, God impresses you. Because when this young lady who probably maybe is going through some terrible situations in her life looks into the mirror, it gives her courage because she sees that in her is Jesus. Remember when we had the message, the light of the world, and we used the mirrors last week, and some of the people came up on the stage, and we said, Jesus is the light of the world. And yet, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So Javier and his son took the mirrors, and they pointed them out to the audience, and the light came out. We had the lights off, and the light came out into the sanctuary. They were reflectors. When we see the reflection of Jesus, it lets us know that Jesus is inside us. And that, brothers and sisters, should give us courage to go forward, whatever we're facing. As I said, I've been reading through Job. And uh, none of us could dare say our lives have been anything compared to the trials, trials that Job faced. Incidentally, I thought it was interesting. Job, Abraham was born on the day that Job's trial started. So if you want to get a kind of an idea of the time frame, uh, his contemporaries, Terah, Abraham's father, was a contemporary of Job. And then, as I said, the day his trial started, Abraham was born. That's in the chronological Bible. I just thought it's interesting, especially for those of us who are studying Genesis on Monday nights. But who are you? Well, I think in order to answer that, we had to look at some other situations. Who are you in Christ Jesus? Well, I think, first of all, we need to see who Christ Jesus is. To really see in reality who he is, because God said, the God the Father said, it is his will for us to be conformed to the image of his dear son. I'm sorry, I was flying, and I know Marshall's translating. So I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. Let's start off looking at John 15. We're going to read verse 16 to start. This is an important part because I think sometimes we forget that we are handpicked. I was talking to a young man who has come to our family. And uh, it was a whole situation to get him back to our school and to get him into our family. He had some really bad situations to face. And I took him aside and I said, I want to tell you something. There's a lot of children born into this world that are called mistakes. They weren't, parents didn't intend to have them, but they had them. And that happens. Not that the parents don't love them after they're here. But I said, with God... I was an enemy of God, and he came after me, and he sought me for years, and he opened my eyes to know him, and he adopted me. I was chosen. And when you know the Lord, you are chosen. And I told this young man, when, when the group of us found out where you were, it was to great lengths to find you and to bring you in. That is love. You were handpicked and handchosen because you are loved. Not because you just happened, but because we sought you and we found you. And brothers and sisters, if you belong to Jesus Christ, it's because he sought you and he found you and he transformed you and adopted you into the family of God. That's great. God lives in us now when we receive Jesus Christ. There's nothing to fear. I, uh, I went up to anoint um, an old friend. Actually, my childhood pastor's sister had a stroke. So I drove up to North Jersey last Monday, and I anointed her. 
and her niece was there, and her niece is about my age, and uh, I had stayed with them when I was younger at their house. And I was always afraid when I was younger. And at their house, their house, uh, part of it was about 250 years old up in North Jersey. And on the deed, it had signatures of American Indians who transferred the property. But it also had a story written there that the woman was sick and the husband went to get help. And when he came back, a wolf had come in and killed his wife and she had bitten off the ear and all. Anyway, the family that lived there always said, we see ghosts in here. Well, that was enough for me. I was not sleeping. Uh, I'm telling you, I was, uh, I, I, you know, they said, you can sleep in the living room. This is where we saw a walk. Well, there was no sleep. I was really scared. So we laughed about it, and I, I told, told this young lady, who was the pastor's daughter, I said, you remember how scared I was back then. I said, you know what, but Jesus Christ has come into me, and now I know that demons fear, because I, I don't believe there's ghosts. When people say my grandmom's talking to me, that's not your grandmom. The Bible says the spirit leaves and goes to the Lord. Demons impersonate people to try to misguide you, but there's no ghost on earth. So demons fear Jesus. So now that I know have, I have Jesus in me, I have confidence. You know, I, I can walk through the dark or anything. I think demons are not going to come after me because they can see who's in me. And the only one on this, in this universe who is to be feared is Jesus Christ, if you want to talk about fear. Not in a, not in a way that he's going to strike us down but in a way that all power belongs unto him. So if there's any fear to be had, as the Bible says, don't fear men who can destroy the body and after that have no power. But I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Not that he's a mean God, but what it's saying is there's only one power, real power in the universe, and that's Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, we have been chosen. Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now, Jesus Christ ordained that. So, let's get this through our minds of who we are in Jesus Christ. He has ordained. That means he has set the plan in motion. How many of you think that there's any power on earth or in heaven that can stop or foil the plan of Jesus Christ when he has a will? Does anybody think you can choose to do different and you'll win? Not, not impossible. The Lord said, all my counsel shall stand. I declare the end from the beginning. You know what end he has declared for those who receive Jesus Christ? The end is eternal life. In fact, Jesus said, the moment you receive me, you've already passed from death unto life. He said, you have eternal life abiding in you, and you shall never perish. Never. Praise God. It's his work, not ours. Now, let's go on and look at some more scriptures. Three scriptures that say the same thing, and I'm bringing this out for a purpose. When Jesus says something three times, it's because he wants to get our attention. Even when he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, it means, hey, listen, listen. So Jesus tells his followers three times what's going to happen, and that just blindsided them. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly. It wasn't like in some parable. Plainly, he told them it was necessary for him to go up to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law, he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. Now, if somebody said that to you, that's pretty plain language, don't you think? It's not mystical language. I wonder if he thinks, if he's just being mystical, he's really going to go to sleep. No, he said, I'm going to be killed. They're going to beat me and kill me, and I'm going to rise again the third day. So, in Matthew 17, next chapter, after they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man, and they know that's him, is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. That's pretty plain again. So after Jesus tells you that twice, you think it might start sinking in. 
chapter 20. Listen, he said. Because we say, uh, I hear. Hearing and listening is two different things. Sometimes when I'm teaching, I, I teach a farm class in the morning to 13 students. So they kind of rotate and they're learning all kinds of things, how to administer supplements and medications and things and how to take care of animals anyway. Sometimes I'll tell them something and they'll turn right around. I said, did you hear me? I heard you. I said, but you didn't listen because I just told you what mixture to use and you totally made the wrong mixture. I said, that's death. That's death to an animal. I said, so details are really important. When you say six milli centi cubic centimeters, it's six cubic centimeters. Not 60. There's a big difference. You know, so if I say one cup of this and two cups, it's one cup and two cups. So I said, now it didn't matter as much I called it. But if you start doing medications or supplements like that, you're going to take them out. So you have to pay attention to details. So that's, that's one of the things they learn is paying attention to details. So paying attention to details, Jesus says, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with the whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. That's three times. Let's go and look at a couple of his disciples. Now, here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes we are terribly discouraged by our circumstances that we face. Amen. Does anybody ever face any circumstances that took you down? I, 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 I won't lie. I definitely have. Circumstances sometimes get you down. You don't have courage. But here's what the problem is. So sometimes it's because we've misunderstood the circumstances or we wrongly perceived and I see I've been dealing with situations um, even among some employees we had a little thing going on and it was misperceptions a lot of times people think they know what the other person means I said in a really good conversation I have a book in my office church communication and conflict in a good conversation 30% of what you're thinking is gets across to the other person because tone of voice can change things. The person is listening. They, uh, they will uh, infer things and you will imply things. And so just remember that in a good conversation, only 30% of what you feel in your heart is getting across. At least 70% margin of error. So you have to remember perception is tremendous. There's, there's a movie called Vantage Point. Uh, about the assassination of a president and you think you've got the story and it keeps backing up like five times and showing from a different angle and you think, wow, I missed that. Because your point of view, your perspective, your perception can be really off. You know, and, and so we have to be careful when we deal with each other. So we can have wrongly perceived circumstances that discourage us too. So here's, here's two disciples who have a really bad perception of what has happened and let's look at it. Luke 24, we'll start at 13, we're going to read down to 27. That same day, now what same day is it? Mary and Martha just ran to the tomb and found it empty. And so they came back and told Peter and John, and Peter and John ran there. So this same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. So, he, you know, they're discussing all the terrible things that went down. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself, he had risen from the grave. Mary and Martha found the empty tomb. Jesus is over here now, deliberately a, a getting, making a meeting with these two disciples. Because, see, he's God, so he knows what's going on. So he deliberately goes this way, just like when God sent Philip to meet the Ethiopian when he was coming back from Jerusalem to back to uh, Ethiopia. So God always arranges meetings. It's amazing how he does it. He does it with you, too. You might not recognize it. Sometimes he puts you right up against a person. A couple weeks ago, I was walking over to Bob's Village Auto, which is out back. And I just felt like I need to go over there. It was some small thing. As I'm going by, a woman is on a porch crying. So I was coming back, and I thought, I've got to walk up to this house. I walked up, and the family was on the porch. They said, this is Grandmom. She's in the final stages of cancer. 
And I said, uh, we'll pray for her. I put her on our boat. And I said, is it all right if I come up and pray with you? And they said, yes, we're all believers. And so we all held hands and prayed together. And it, it was, you know, I think the Lord just said, like, I'm going to walk you by right now and let's all join together and pray. Perez family. So keep them in prayer. They're in the bulletin. But I don't ever think there's accidental meetings. When God puts you somewhere, sometimes you even go to a store and there will be a person. I went over to Wawa the other day. And I was walking in, and, I, you know, there's always beggars out and all. And I saw the lady sitting there, and I thought, I'll try to go in quickly. And she said something. And I said, uh, she said, I'm hungry. And I said, what do you want to eat? She said, anything. Anything you will give me, I am really hungry. So, you know, I knew she wasn't after money. She didn't ask for anything. She just said, I'm really hungry. So I'm, I'm not blowing my horn. I went in and ordered sandwich and drink and everything. But the Lord puts you at places for a reason. There's no accident. So Jesus arranges a meeting, and as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written all across their faces. He sees they are really depressed and discouraged. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. Like, how do you not know this? This is like, you know, breaking news. This is major news. This is Jerusalem. This is the Romans. This is a priest. What things, Jesus asked. Now, he's not saying what things because he needs to know. You, you realize that. The things that happened to Jesus, a man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did my powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel, because they were looking for a new Solomon, a new David, to lead them out from under the saddle of Roman rule. They weren't looking for salvation. They only wanted to break Rome so they could continue in their pride as we are the number one people and never dealing with the heart. This all happened three days ago, they said. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. It's like shocking. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. See, at this point I would have to give my sarcastic look. Because he's already told them three times this is going to happen and now they're amazed. Like, we, we are baffled at this. And I would have to give them the stare. Yeah, when we had our high school up at Bethany Baptist, our water fountain broke. So I put a chair, one of these chairs like this. I took the whole fountain off the wall, and I had pipes hanging out, and I set the fountain on the chair. And a high school girl came up to me and said, Mr. Kelly, is the water fountain broken? <laughs> and I stared, and I, thought, I didn't say anything, because at this point I'm thinking, is this for real? And I just looked over at it, and she said, can I still get a drink from it? And I still stared, and I couldn't even answer. I was like... Have you been eating all the lead paint off your radiators at home? That's what, not to say that, but it was like, because <laughs> then she asked me in Bible class if, if Noah took two of every well on the ark. But anyway, it was, uh, I was, you know, sometimes you just look. After telling them three times this is going to happen and they say, we're shocked, I would look at them like, what, what do you not get? I told you really plainly I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again the third day and you're in shock. You see what happens? So their discouragement comes not only from not knowing who they are, they don't really know who the Lord is. They don't know the power of the resurrection. And that's why Jesus has to fix this problem. When we're discouraged, a lot of times, it's because we don't know not only who we are, we don't know who he is. But you don't realize what I'm going through. You don't realize how serious this is. The Lord does. But I don't know if he cares. Of course he cares. He already knew this before the foundation of the world. You're shocked at what touched you. He's not. 
And he promised you that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord. He is all powerful. He's able to change anybody. He's able to turn the heart of the king the way he turns water. He's able to turn the heart of your boss. He's able to turn the heart of your neighbor, your co-worker, your spouse, your children. And all the struggles, God can turn all of that in a moment, but he often doesn't. He often teaches us in it that we're go you're going through a valley right now, and you're going to lean on me. And I'm going to show you I can take you through anything with joy in your heart and peace in your mind, and you'll go through the hardest time singing praises. And that's what God brings us to. I can change a situation, and I will, but right now... This is a teaching time, and I'm going to teach you when the bottom completely falls out, I'm there. I am there, and you can lean on me, and I promise you I'll carry you through this. And before you come out, I'm going to teach you peace in the trial, and then I'm going to change the trial. Amen? I mean, I've had that happen so many times. The turmoil, the turmoil, sick, I'm afraid I'm going to die, and finally you're still sick, and you say, well, you know what? I'm not going to die because Jesus Christ is in me. And you finally get such confidence that you're not looking at the trial, you're looking at the Lord. No matter if it's sickness, no matter if it's financial, if it's uh, any kind of trouble or turmoil, Jesus teaches you, I can give you peace right in the trial. And then I'll change the trial. Praise God. So some of our men ran to see him. Sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. I hate to say no duh, but no duh. Anyway. He goes on to say, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. I told you three times, if you start at Genesis 1, chapter 1, you'll see this all the way through, because the volume of the book is written of me. If you'd remembered Abraham offering Isaac, the whole thing, every story points to me. I don't know why it's shocking, except for his blindness. And that's what it is, it's blindness. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Isaiah 53 is, a, is the most elaborate picture of what Jesus is going through. In fact, Psalm 22 opens, if you read it in Hebrew, not in English, if you read it in Hebrew, it opens and closes with the first and last words on the cross. Jesus' first words and his last words at the beginning and end of Psalm 22. And the whole Psalm 22 describes crucifixion in detail. And the crucifixion wasn't even invented till hundreds and hundreds of years later, if not thousands. But the whole thing is Jesus on the cross. Psalm 22 is his first and last words. It's Jesus' description of what he's going through on the cross. It's amazing. In fact, some, uh, some of the prophecies are so accurate that... People who do like literary criticism and all say that they had to be written after the death and resurrection, but they weren't. It's proven they were written. The Dead Sea Scrolls proved they were written before. Isaiah was written long before. Anyway, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Maybe when we're discouraged, maybe it's time that God opens up our eyes to see the scriptures and to see what he has, has done for us and who he is. It's impossible for him to lie. He's always faithful. Well, what if he chooses not to? He doesn't choose not to. I, I get tired of the unbelief. Well, you know, maybe it's God's will for you not to get the victory. No, it's not God's will not to get the victory. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, so God says no sometimes. No. All the promises of God are yes and in him amen to the glory of God the Father. So when people choose not to believe and they kind of ignore the word of God and then say, my experience shows me that Jesus doesn't always fulfill. Well, your experience has nothing to do with the promise of God. Because the experience of trusting in God is always victory. Amen. Otherwise, if people say, well, maybe it's not his will to supply my needs. Maybe it's not his will to heal me. Well, maybe it's not his will to save people either. So why don't you just say, God, if it's your will, save my family. If not, send them to hell. We would never say that. But all the promises of God are yes in him. Amen. 
So that's one of the things. Sometimes it's not realizing who he is. And then other times our discouragement comes from looking at who we are, who we think we are, and not at who God says we are. Now, if I ask you in here right now, raise your hand if you are perfect. Who would raise their hands? And here's the trouble. I hear people say all the time, I'm not what I should be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be. And I think, well, that's the most ungodly, unbiblical thing I've ever heard. Because I'm in Christ and I am who I should be. Who I should be is in Christ. But your behavior, I'm not talking about my behavior, I'm talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ that I'm clothed in. I am justified that by one offering he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart for God. Are you set apart for God? Absolutely. If you've received Christ, you've been set apart as God's own. Now, you're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. So forget what's under the, under the clothing. Because that's not where we're to be looking. If you're looking at yourself for grounds of encouragement, you're looking at the wrong place. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the glory of God. So, if I'm in Christ, and if I'm clothed in his righteousness, what am I? Perfect. By one offering, he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more sacrifice for sins. So put away the Day of Atonement. I'm coming to get my sins forgiven again, Lord. And he's saying, I've dealt with that issue. You need life. If when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, we are saved by his life. So if you keep going around saying, yeah, I'm not good, I'm not perfect, you're looking at yourself and that's the problem. You're not believing the promise of God. See, faith is, does it, you know what faith is? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when, when you've got bills and you say, but I don't have the money in the account, what is faith? It's saying that God's going to take care of it, even though I don't see it, right? When you're sick and you say, but... Uh, the promise of God says, with his stripes I healed. What is that? That's faith, right? When you're still messing up, when you said a curse word, when you got angry and you still say, but I still belong to God, and you don't just say, you know what, I should give up. I'm not a Christian anyway. I'm no good. Hoo, 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 poor me. Then you're not having faith. You're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight, and the sight's in the wrong place too. Am I right? So, we're looking at ourselves instead of the Lord and what he says about us. Now, let's look at some scriptures. Matthew 26, 73. In case you think these superheroes in the Bible, uh, the, the Superman and the Iron Man and all that, whatever you want to call them, all these Bible characters, they were humans just like you and were subject to like passions just like you. Let's take Peter. Is Peter a character that we could look up to? Should be, I mean, but no more than anybody else. He's really no different than you. And after a while came unto him, this is when Jesus was on trial, came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your speech berays you. I can tell by your speech you're a Christian. You're one of Jesus' followers. He's on trial. And Peter is scared, and Jesus already told him, you'll deny me three times. And he told him, I prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail, and when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. But watch Peter. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not, probably the blankety blank man you blanking people get the, away from me. He's cursing and swearing. Because they said your speech shows your Christian, they thought. Obviously, we're wrong because his speech not showing this. It's anyway, and immediately the cock crew. So he said, I'll go into prison and death with you. I'll never deny you. And now he's not only denying him three times, he's cursing up a storm. He's swearing and cursing and carrying on. Anger and all kind of lashing out. So how does he feel at this point? And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. 
And you can imagine, Judas went out and hanged himself. Peter at this point has a choice. He can go hang himself, which are really sealed the deal. I, I talk to people quite often. I mean, I've had a lot of people who call me and tell me I'm going to kill myself. I told them to tell you something. The second your eyes close, don't think you're going to sleep and everything's getting peaceful. You're going to be in the presence of the Lord, if you know Him. And if you don't, things are going to get 40 billion times worse. And whatever you're facing right now, I guarantee you hell is a lot worse. And you will seal the deal because if you don't know the Lord, you are 100% going to hell for eternity. So you're going to go faster by killing yourself. If you've received the Lord, you need to trust Him to go through this situation. If you haven't received the Lord and you kill yourself, don't think you're going to get like, I'm going to sleep for 100 years or anything. You're not going to sleep for a second. You're going to be in big trouble. You're talking about out of the frying pan into the fire, it's going to get really bad. So before you pull the trigger or whatever, because one of, a couple of them told me they're pulling the trigger, I said, before you pull the trigger, you better think, because as soon as you hear the bang, you're going to be in a really, really hot situation. That is not an option. The Lord can get you through anything. The Lord is with us. So Peter could do that. But you know what he did? He thought, I'm no good. I used to be a fisherman. Jesus said, I'll make you a fisherman. Obviously, he had the wrong person. And I'm not worth anything. I'm a worthless, sinful, angry, cursing person that shouldn't be around Jesus in the first place. So he says, I'm going back to the fishing trade. So he said, I'm going fishing. And a couple of his buddies, you know, they thought Jesus died. Let's go fishing too. We'll just go back to fishing again. So Jesus came along on the shore and he sees them out there and he knows they're not catching anything. And so Jesus builds a little fire and he puts fish on it. And he's, I love the way Jesus does. He doesn't come and say, shame on you. You said you wouldn't deny me. You deny me. Now you're back. You're leaving the discipleship. You're going back to fishing. Jesus just comes up. Hey, hey children, do you have any meat? Come and dine. He said, come and dine. So he sits there calmly. Jesus is real calm, and he lets them all eat. He just sits there, talks to them. They don't, didn't know who he was at first. So after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord. He replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. What did I call you to do? I know what you called me to do, but do you see how I failed? Do you see who I am? You called me and there's never been a change. I'm still angry. I'm still cursing. I don't belong. How can I teach other people about you when I'm such a horrible person myself? Jesus didn't address any of that. He doesn't even say you denied me. He doesn't say that you cursed and you swore. He just says, I called you to feed my lambs. But Lord, look at my condition. I'm not talking about your condition is that you have, and on Pentecost you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, so settle down. The condition is that I called you and the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. I never changed my mind. I called you to follow me and I will never change my mind on that. You are righteous in me. So feed my lambs. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. He's still, probably still mind boggled. I'm a bad example. How can, how can I be a shepherd? Well, you're not a shepherd. A pastor is never a shepherd. We are overseers. There's only one shepherd, and that's Jesus. When people say, oh, pastor, you're a shepherd of the flock. They're like, oh, you're way off. There's one shepherd. There's overseers. Like there's a shepherd that takes care of the flock, and they have helpers. We're the helpers. And as Bob George said, we're sheepdogs. The only thing we should be doing is hurting people toward the shepherd. That's what the dog does. He runs around and chases the sheep back to the shepherd. That's the only thing I can do. I am not a shepherd. I'm a sheepdog. You start going the wrong way, I might bite your heels and chase you back that way, back to Jesus. But I'm not your shepherd. And neither is any man. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. A third time he asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. 
He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. I asked you to come away from this and to be mine, and I never have changed my mind. You're mine. And this is what I've asked you to do. And it has nothing to do with what you see in yourself. It has to do with allowing me to live my life through you. And see that by my word, my word says, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are coming. But I don't see that, Lord. Where is it changed? You know how many times in my own life I've gone before the Lord and we, And I said, where is this new man you said? Where is this new man, Lord? It's been years and years, and all I see is the same Chuck Kelly. Where is this? Where's the promise? Why am I still the same? And it's because I'm looking at these, with these. And the Lord's saying, that's not what I see. You need to surrender and realize that I'm divine and you're the branch. The branch cannot, cannot, cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. We need to trust Him, and the more we see who He is, and then the more we see that I'm a new creature. And I hate to keep using this same example. A worm crawling on the ground, right? It's a worm, crawls in the dirt, goes very slowly, and the Lord comes along and says, Hey, worm, you tired of crawling in the dirt? I can change you into a beautiful butterfly through metamorphosis, but you can never be a, a worm again. When I change you, you'll never be what you were again. So he wraps a cocoon around us, and this beautiful butterfly comes out. Instead of crawling in moments, it can fly all across from one person's yard to another. It drinks nectar from flowers. It's not crawling in the dirt anymore. And then you see the butterfly on the ground crawling. And you come over and say, look at the butterfly. It must be injured. It's on the ground. And that's the way we do sometimes. We start crawling in the dirt, and the Lord, it's like he comes along with a big mirror. Look up here, Chuck. What do you say? A butterfly, Lord. Who is that butterfly? It's me, Lord. What are you doing crawling in the dirt? I didn't recreate you to crawl. I recreated you to fly. Now get up and sin no more. Not a threat, sin no more. A word of power, sin no more. I'm giving you the authority and the power not to sin anymore. You don't belong here. You don't belong in the dirt. It's like the king who came along and saw the prostitute sitting on the side of the road. He said, hey, prostitute, I want to marry you. And she said, what? I want to marry you. She said, okay, so he marries her. She goes into the palace. She's had a crown. She's got a royal robe. She's sitting on the throne. What is she now? Prostitute? No, queen. Does it make sense for her to take that robe off and go sit on the curb again? It wouldn't make sense. You'd say, what are you doing out here? You're a queen. It made sense when you're a prostitute. Now it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. When I was lost, when I was spiritually dead, it made sense to do dead things, rotten things, because that's what dead people do. They stink because they're rotten. But now that I'm alive, it doesn't make sense to do that anymore. And when God finally shows us how stupid sin is, then we have it. You start saying, wow, this doesn't make sense. It made sense before, but it doesn't make sense for a new creature. And God transforms us by the renewing of our mind, by seeing our identity in Christ Jesus. And that's what takes place. So let's ask God to help us see who we are. Have you received Jesus Christ? If you have, then you are a Ben Elohim, a child of God. You're a new creature. Walk as children of light. How do you do that? By trying harder? No, by surrendering completely. John the Baptist said, I have to decrease so he can increase. So John the Baptist started disappearing from the scene, and Jesus took over as the preeminent one, which he is. In our lives, we have to grow down, not up, so that Jesus can be the preeminent one and have the throne of our hearts. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Marcia, would you leave us? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for everything you made us. Keep it bringing our minds to remember all the time, not who we are, but who you are in us. So help us to put in our minds, and even the trap and the trouble we have been walking through, we know you are the God who made us, who thinking us before we even born, before the, all the bad situations come to our life, you was God. You already was God, and you, all the times you have been carrying us in your 
sweet hands and say, I am with you all the time. Don't fear. So help us to look at you, Jesus, in the trials, and look at you in the sickness, and in anything you have been passed through, because you are the God creator, and if you are with us, who will be against us? Thank you so much for your beautiful love. Thank you, thank you so much for the cross. Thank you so much for thinking us when we never think of you before. We love you, Jesus. Help us to keep this in mind. Thank you for Pastor Kelly. Thank you for these words. And we thank you so much again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.